This week's podcast is with Ali Mameni. I'm sure many of you have interacted with him in some way, whether it was during his time at Simat in Paris, maybe at our University of Minnesota, or maybe currently at uh, Carnegie Mellon. Uh, he's an incredible educator and he gets involved in many, many things. We dive into a lot of that in this podcast. I hope you enjoy. I first met Ali on, uh, via email. He was part of the early Max discussion mail lists and has always been active in that community and active in a lot of other communities as well. I first met him face to face uh, when he was working up in Minneapolis and his involvement with the Spark Festival there when I was invited to do some performances. Um, He is just one of these tireless inventors and uh, creators. I did an interview with him in 2010 for the Cycling 74 website, but I really wanted a chance to uh, interview him for this podcast. Hi, Ali. How are you? Very good. Thank you. Um, I like to start these uh, these discussions, these conversations with having you share a little bit about your background. Why don't you tell us uh, how you got to where you are today? Sure. Um, well, I'm actually an Iranian citizen as well as an American citizen. So my story starts in a different continent and I found my way into the creative practices uh, through what might seem like a very indirect route, but finally as inspiration for many uh, first-generation immigrants who may have had various societal pressures to become one thing or another as adults, uh, I'll say that I was not intended to be an artist as, a, as an occupation. Um, I found myself in the States at the age of 12, and I studied physics in undergraduate because I was a pre-med student. You know, I had some ideas that I was going to be a doctor like many other Iranians that moved to the States in their teens. And uh, I had a really, really critical person in my life, a a piano teacher by the name of Tony Barone, Marc Antonio Barone, in the Philadelphia area, um, whose uh, relationship I really owe to my mother, um, like many other things I owe to my mother. But he's the person uh, that really allowed me to take the arts more seriously uh, than I'd ever considered. And ironically, he offered to help me become a music major late in the game. So I finished the physics major in the first two years and I realized I had two more years and I could do something else. And uh, Tony really generously offered to bring me up to date on all that was taught in the first two years of undergraduate music theory, harmony, counterpoint, all that stuff in a matter of months under one condition that, um, and the condition was that I wouldn't make music my livelihood which was a very interesting con- condition to impose. And I'm glad to say that after all the years, I could, I've actually now met that condition because I'm firmly grounded in the visual arts. Uh, I still have a lot of musical interests, uh, obviously, but I work uh, more and more with things, objects, structures, uh, in the direction of sculpture and architecture and all that is um, the, the augmented, expanded versions of that. Um, I came out of the music world. I went to UC Berkeley uh, and was a researcher and a composer at the Center for New Music and Audio Technology. So people like David Wessel and Edmund Campion and many others at CMU, Adrian Free, these people were really, really critical to my um, development and I still consider them very important mentors. Uh, And after graduate school with my composition degree, I took some time and lived abroad in Paris for a while and really tried the life of a musical maker and it was a diff- it was a difficult one for a number of reasons that are um, you know kind of in the old times now and maybe not even so much so interesting to get into anymore but uh, what became possible around the time I got out of grad school 2005 2006 was that many university programs were beginning interdisciplinary arts programs and I landed uh, a very 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 um, what turned out to be a productive position for me at the University of Minnesota. And since my background was in music, my degree was in music, but the things that I I was making at that time were more sculptures, they gave me the choice of whether I wanted to be in music or in art. And I chose art because there was so much more that came with it in terms of facilities and and spaces and resources and new things to learn for me, um, which has always been a motivation for me. I'm a lifelong student and constantly looking for... um, I don't know, maybe even going back to school at some point. It seems ridiculous since I have a PhD, but um, I can imagine three, four other things I'd 
like to get a PhD in, but we're only going to live to be 80. So I'm going to have to pick my battles. And um, after Minnesota, I ended up at, at uh, Carnegie Mellon University uh, firmly in sculpture in the School of Arts, where I've done a lot of works that are really about the extensions of the arts outside of the, the gallery and the museum. And while I'm interested in those venues still, um, I'm increasingly interested in how art thinking and humanities thinking can affect a whole host of other fields from the obvious ones like design and architecture and industrial design and product design to the you know now obvious ones like social media and, and physical computing and all that, but also to governance and public policy and urban planning and all the other places where artists have now started to find a place for themselves where they can uh, express their superpowers but also make important contributions to, to larger communities than the museum goers and gallery goers. Well, that's really interesting. Um, and... <laughs> You've opened the door for a lot of things I'd like to talk to you about because there's uh, there's a lot there. But I am fascinated by this idea that your music mentor wanted to divert your attention from trying to make a living at it. Why did he ever say why he made that stipulation? Um, he he didn't. He didn't. Uh, he and I were very close, and we had a lot of conversations that had a lot of unspoken moments with plenty of understanding flowing underneath. Uh, in retrospect, I think there are two reasons why he said that. Uh, one is the obvious one that, you know, if you have a passion, um, the recipe for ruining that passion is to rely on it for your livelihood, which will surely force you to exploit your passion in however many ways people make known to you or the world makes available to you. And I, I understand what he meant by that. In some ways, for me, prioritizing teaching, luckily because I love it so much, but teaching has been the way that I've been able to, excuse the verbiage, monetize my interest in the arts. But um, at the same time, there was another current under his comment that was more about, um, it really was more about my mother. I think somewhere along the line, he knew that my mother was interested in me having a safe career. And music is not, you know, the known safe career in the world. So in some ways, uh, out of his respect for my mother, he laid that condition down and implicitly gave me the permission to break it, obviously, <laughs> since he was allowing me to now officially pursue a major that could lead to other things. Right. Well, that's that's really interesting um, because there is uh, there is a this fabric of um, art or music is not being a very satisfying career thing. I know certainly my you know, when, when my mother tries to explain to people what it is that I do, she never talks about me being a creative or me being involved even in software development. What she always talks about is the fact that I teach. There's something about teaching that has a respect level uh, for our parents that uh, sort of helps them cope with the idea that we've taken on this creative life. It's very interesting. Um so let's talk a little bit about your about the decision to focus on art when your education would have implied uh, music, even even teaching in a music. I mean, because certainly having gone through the program at Berkeley, you were uh, put in a position where you could have pursued a music education uh, opportunity. But they, that program is kind of interesting because it also does have this embrace of a multidisciplinary uh, life. You know, certainly their use of coding, their, their use of sort of like inventing things within the program is pretty well known. And for a while, you were a star uh, of that program, wouldn't you say? I mean, it's probably hard for you to say that, but um. <laughs> <laughs> um, that that place is really important to me. I um, I got I, I learned so much from that place, not just about techniques and and repertoire and all that stuff, but also about how to deal with with collaboration and how to look for exciting opportunities between the arts and the sciences. And so, yeah, very 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 formative for me. Uh, as for how it is that I'm now in in a school of art as opposed to a school of music. Um, I can relate it to how my mentors would respond to this. And again, I have, um, I, I very quickly, concretely think of four or five mentors uh, that are, you know, all based in California, actually, also, 
uh, who are in some ways connected to music. So starting with my dissertation advisor, David Wessel, he's someone who so, is so committed to music. And um, what I loved about David in terms of his witnessing my transition to the arts was that he just expressed that ultimately non-judgmental quality that he has towards everything and everyone. And, and, and he knew that if I were to enter the arts, uh, I would be one of the artists who's more aware of musical sensibility than the others and more interested in it. And I wouldn't lose my footing uh, in, in music. As for Edmund, who was also the co-signer of my dissertation, uh, he actually recognized very early on that there is an incredible opportunity for musicians, for sound artists within the world of contemporary art. Um, he, it, it, he thought that actually that particular aspect of contemporary art at that time, this was in the 90s, was quite impoverished in, in comparison to the level of rigor that you see in electroacoustic music at places sure. like Kidnat or Irkhan or whatever. So that seemed like a, you know, a, a positive, even in terms of a, a career choice, move to him. Um, I had another mentor in California who's a really, really important person to me, and, um, and he's Adrian Fried, the research director at Sinmat, and he was someone, though, uh, again, his personal interest had always been in music and a very deep um, emotional connection to music that drove him to find out about the music of many parts of the world. And what I learned from him was that musicians and musical thinking has so much to teach so many other people also. So the way that he started, for instance, that whole movement of working on open sound control. And, right. and now we just see the irony of how open sound control is, you know, more often than not used to control not sound, but <laughs> right. many other things. So right. I think Adrian was one to realize early on that the kind of demands that musicians have for accuracy, for precision, for timing, for control, for real time, for intuitive interaction, these things are going to be very important for a lot of people and you know lo and behold 10 years later we see that uh, more and more these these requirements are important for people working with arduinos and the physical computing world and all of that um, another really important californian mentor for me is a fellow by the name of jay butler who's um, um he's in in some ways a, a informal self-selected godfather of mine and he too hmm. spent a lot of time in the music business as a as a road manager and he traveled with big acts all over the world in the 70s and 80s and um, he's someone who again every time I showed him something that I'd done the first thing that he would respond with was wow you could take this and take it to and then some other place that was so far away from this concert stage and um, I, I remember early on you know 15 years ago thinking wow Jay really sees something in this that I should be <laughs> seeing also and then maybe finally my other favorite Californian um, I'll mention them even as a pair, Letitia Sonami and, and um, Paul De Marinos, who are again two really, really formative and, and um, for me very, have, they've been very helpful to me in, in sorting out what I do with sound and music. And both of them, again, if you look at their trajectory, they started with a very explicit interest in music and improvisation and building instruments and, and all those hacky things that led to the world of Max and Pure Data and whatnot. But them too have realized that musicians can show so much to um, you know non-musical audiences outside of musical venues. So both of them have had careers that have evolved, uh, you know, very fairly far and deep into the galleries and museums and public works. And again, um, really concentrating on the making aspect of uh, musicianship as well as the sound making aspect of it. Right, that's absolutely true, and um, I'm constantly reminded of that. I um, I have a small teaching practice uh in in an art school and one of the things that i'm constant that uh i'm constantly seeing is sort of parallels between what we might have done as musicians and composers and what the art world is moving to to the point where um you know concepts with sequencing concepts with uh harmonization and stuff like that all those sort of conceptual tools that musicians have dealt with for years and years are starting to be understood as having a place within uh, the broader art world. And it's really interesting to see that embrace taking place. Now, I, I have a question for you. Uh, many of, or all of the mentors, really, that you just described, uh, save for uh, this first music teacher, I have been Californians, but you are very specifically not a California-based guy. You were at University of Minnesota for a while. Now you're at Carnegie Mellon down in uh, Pittsburgh, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 
I should know. I should know that instead of having to ask it as a question. <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, how do you how do you keep in contact with them and keep that sort of creative flow going with your mentors when there's that physical distance? Do you travel out there a lot, or do you keep in contact, or is it more kind of a psychic connection? Um, it's there's definitely a psychic connection and. I find that as I get older and they get older and our schedules become more complex, that psychic connection finally becomes more and more important. And at some point, when one of us passes, that is the connection that lives on. That remains, um, yeah. I, 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 I took, a, took pleasure in hearing you say that I'm distinctly so categorically not a California guy. It's actually, oddly enough, whenever I've lived outside of California, uh, and that's been most of my life, I was only in California for about four years during the Berkeley years, um, everyone that I'm around has tended to think that I'm kind of a California guy. <laughs> so in Pittsburgh, I'm probably as California as it as it gets. But um, I have to say that at least looking back at, at my last um, 20 years or so, I tend to move every four years or so. And I tend not to go back to places. And, sure. um, you know, California is not going anywhere. And my, <laughs> my love affair with California is certainly not going anywhere. So I would... Um, I, I would be reluctant to say that I'm never going to live there again. I'd be happy to uh, find another opportunity and try a different part of the world. But um, I've really followed my nose on places that I've moved to. So when I moved to France after Berkeley, it was really to see how composition and electroacoustic music can really function within a society when there is actually a state structure, a governance structure that supports it. Right. So that clear, isn't, clearly isn't in place in America, whereas it's clearly in place in France. And that was important for me. And and then the next shift, going to University of Minnesota, that was distinctly a decision to start learning how to make things. And, and when they gave me that opportunity to, um, to be in the School of Art, then that was really a no-brainer. Right. Uh, you know, I stepped into a scenario where I had access to every piece of machine fabrication that you could dream of and all these big studios. And a lot of people who are really craftsmen and thinkers and, and doers and makers. And so it happened to be Minnesota. But you know, um, I loved Minnesota. You know, I had my you know, hard times with the winter and the distance among people and all that, but um, I could not be more grateful for everything that um, that community taught me and that, that uh, those years really brought me. A lot of the works that I made, you know, all of the works that I made that got me the job at Carnegie Mellon were made during that time with the help of um, that whole world. And then for Carnegie Mellon, um, I really wanted to be in a scenario where I can start to apply the work that I'm doing in the arts to uh, areas outside of the arts in a very direct and distinct way. And that was harder at a giant public research university like the Big Ten University certainly, of Minnesota. Certainly. Whereas at Carnegie Mellon, it's smaller, it's more intimate. There's a long history of interdisciplinary working and thinking. And it's a kind of uh, money talks and BS walks sort of place. Too. <laughs> so if you've really done a lot of stuff and you're ready to put energy, people recognize that that energy and, and, and support your venture. So yeah, I'm going along this way. I'm not quite sure what the next stage might be, but uh, who knows? Maybe I'll be living in Shenzhen for a couple of years, right. uh, learning some other technique, mostly uh, probably practicing my backhand because I'm also a ping pong addict. And How are you? It'd be great to do the place to do that, yeah. Uh, well, we're going to have to meet up at a ping pong table at some point. I used to be a pretty serious ping ponger at one time. Oh, how exciting. I didn't yeah, know that. Yeah. Um, it's been a while, so I, I'm probably a little rusty. But but it's like riding a bike, isn't it? It's like riding a bike, exactly. <laughs> well, one of the things I would say is that in the places that you've been, you've certainly left your mark. I would, uh, And not, all, not necessarily just in the artistic community, although you've often used artistic, the artistic community sort of as a, as a lever. I know certainly in... in Minnesota, you're you know you really helped expand uh, what Doug had done with the Spark Festival into being, you know even, uh, you know uh, uh, I would say a bigger or a more expansive uh, festival, uh, and you had that uh, street art project with the bikes. I can't remember the name of it right off the yeah the mall the yeah. Mall. yeah and um, that was that was kind of interesting because I noticed that if you go and like do Google searches or document searches on that, that was a project that really caught the interest of the community at large. It was something that it at least seemed like you had to have some some level of interaction with local 
government in order to be able to pull that off. Mm -hmm. And um, it was, uh, it, it certainly, you know, it left a mark on the community, which I think is a, is a tenant for great, great um, locational art, you know, and um, now you are in, in Pittsburgh, which is actually a smaller town, and I would assume that CMU probably uh, represents a pretty influential uh, existence in the in the city. Do you mm -hmm. think that uh, that opens more doors to do doing things like this, where you are uh, sort of like igniting the interest of the community? Um, there are yeah, there are a lot of opportunities like that here. <clears throat> You're right, Pittsburgh is a little bit small, smaller than Minneapolis, but um, while some of the things about these places are quite different, the demographics are quite different, um, the culture is quite different, there are a lot of things about the two places that are also very, very close and similar. They're both very ambitious cities right now that are, are, are turning over a certain period of their life and becoming very attractive to other people that are looking for new American cities that offer a lot of affordances that the big cities don't offer. So. There is a, a kind of buzz around that's it's, it can be muted at times, but there is a buzz about um, you know what we can get started. There are very similar opportunities again in in support for the arts. I have to say, the state of Minnesota, you know, um, it beats every other state in the country in terms of what it provides for its artists. So that level of uh, the foundations and the old families and um, that kind of activity that I was able to get started in Minnesota may be a bit harder to get started in Pittsburgh. Not to mention that it's really hilly here and it rains a lot. So oh, right. um, that project would have to change if it were to get started here. Sure. But um, what I uh, am more and more involved in now, which is also in, in many ways a community-driven and, and a, a kind of meta project, is that I've become a lot more interested in the pedagogy of, um, of this very complex medium of ours that in my case and in your case and many others also has started in music but now is coming into the visual arts through physical computing but now it's also coming into pr product design and, and a cultural innovation and all those things and CMU and Pittsburgh are definitely good places to be for those kinds of activities. I've been able to gain access to both um, colleagues outside of my area and the engineering but also communities way outside of uh, Pittsburgh that are aware of and interested in working with us because it is Carnegie Mellon and it does have a long history of bringing different disciplines together. So um, yeah, I am starting a bunch of things up, but I'm not, I'm, I'm leaving the mall project in Minneapolis. I think that was a, um, it's a thing that's bigger than me now in some ways. It's going <laughs> to go on and, you know, I'm one of the admins on the website and I, right. <laughs> and I uh, rarely make changes. So I'm really delighted to see that, that a project like that lives on and and hopefully whatever I get started here will uh, can, you know, live beyond my years also. Right. Well, let's talk about some of the things you're doing at, at Carnegie Mellon. Um, one of the things I know is that you're involved in a project called ArtFab, which when I dig into what it is that ArtFab's doing, it looks like, um, it looks like the maker world on steroids. It's, I mean, I... I grew up, my, my father was a co-owner of a manufacturing company, mm -hmm. and so I grew up around, but it was a small manufacturing company, but I grew around walking, you know, into welder shops or uh, the big lathe shops and stuff like this. I got to see things being made, and I, that whole sort of like, there's a part of my DNA that's wired to be fascinated and into sort of this the actual creation of physical objects. And um, I look at what ArtFab is doing, and it looks like you are exploring every possibility for sort of that maker thing, but in a very creative way. Can you explain a little bit, first of all, what the ArtFab is, and then uh, what what it is that you're doing in conjunction with it? Sure. Um, so ArtFab is a facility within the School of Art at Carnegie Mellon University, and the School of Art divides very neatly, more or less, into 2D, 3D, and 4D. Uh, 2D being drawing, painting, printmaking, and photography. 3D being site-specific and installation sound, which is my area. And 4D being um, new media, video, uh, performance, animation, everything with a timeline. Sure. And normally, if, if you know someone had looked at my CV five years ago, they would have thought that I would fit into the 4D area, whereas 
Carnegie Mellon, you know, I, I owe it to my colleagues. They decided to make a very decisive and, and, and strategic um, hire in choosing me to be in sculpture. So obviously me being in sculpture at a school that was decked out with a traditional wood shop and traditional metal shop and even a small foundry, in addition to all the other things like ceramics and, of course, painting and drawing and all that stuff, um, that was a decision they made. They wanted to see what would happen if someone with a background like mine were to start uh, rethinking and, and reorganizing and, uh, and uh, advancing what they do with uh, making objects, like you said. Right. So um, when I came to CMU, in the CMU style, there's a certain part of the building that uh, is essentially my domain. And that area was an area that comprised of the wood shop, uh, a, a small assembly r uh, room for woodworking, and then a f um, you know metal area with welding, and also a fairly out of sorts, out of date, uh, retired um, foundry for metal casting work. And uh, when I arrived here, they really gave me a lot of support and a kind of carte blanche in um, deciding what to do with these facilities. And um, the direction that I've been trying to push things is to first to build an arsenal of sophisticated machine fabrication tools. Second, to build a whole scaffolding of uh, software and resources and tutorials and courses that help people use those things. And third, to try to connect all of that to the real world. And uh, for me, that connection is one in combining digital fabrication with traditional fabrication. So that's something that ArtFab is very interested in. Uh, you know, we have all the typical things like the CNC routers and 3D printers and laser cutters, but we're more and more building, um, let's say, a traditional fabrication tools like vacuum forming and steam bending and whatnot, which pair really nicely with digital fabrication. So we're making sure that while our students get exposed to CAD and CAM in their first year as a student, as a freshman here, they also learn how to make molds and use plastics and, and, and weld and use their, their hands and how to hold the hammer and all that stuff. So ArtFab is, um, in that way, it's, it's a bit different than your usual tinkering studio or your usual maker space or hacker space. Um, I did um, actually make a physical computing lab for CMU for the first time in a long time. Surprising, Carnegie Mellon School of Art didn't have something like that, but now we have, um, you know, ArtFab Blue, we call it, is a, is a very comfortable and very well stocked and, and, and um, decked out uh, f space for doing all that is, you know, in between the digital and the physical. So the Arduino world, the wireless world, we're doing, doing a lot of work with robotics and off-the-shelf robotics and quadcopters and all that stuff. But geographically in the building, that space is right next to a traditional wood shop, right above a welding shop, and also right above a big assembly space with the routers and the vacuum formers and whatnot. So a lot of what we're doing is trying to bring all of those different media uh, from an equal footing without privileging the digital over the analog or the other way. Uh, making all of those things available to students that more and more, what I see, um, students that really don't care if it's digital or analog, whatever, you know, they grew up with all of it as one. So uh, I'm trying to build a facility where, where we teach all of it as, you know, not really different from another, just different choices of how, how you make things. Right. That's really interesting because um, this sort of like meshing of analog and digital processing, I think, first of all, I think it's, I think it's brilliant because uh, if for no other reason, just from a practical standpoint, the, the practicalities of saying, you know, I'm a digital artist that works in 3D space, and um, so everything I do has to be formed by our, either a CNC router or a digital print, uh, a 3D printer, is really limiting given the deep history that there is in some of these other making systems. I mean, you talk about things like steam bending or mold making. I mean, mold making is fascinating. What you can get from a mold, a uh, created mold, is much different than what a 3D printer is going to create. And so I think it's really awesome that you're, um, you're introducing people not only to the most current digital form of making, but also to some uh, really deep historical methods as well. I think that's, that's fabulous. But the other thing that I would uh, that I would say about that is that you must end up with really interesting sort of like cross cultural decisions being made. You know, so for example, uh, 
you know, getting people who primarily work on a screen to take that, to find ways to take that screen based information and turn it into something physical. It's one thing when you have like a 3D printer or a router, it's another thing when you have a complete workshop, a uh, wood, woodworking shop, or a complete metalworking shop. What are some of the more adventurous ways that you see people um, sort of like jump in the shark from one discipline to another? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, I have to say that I really owe it to our students here, our undergraduates uh, and our graduate students. But um, the undergrads, you really notice because they haven't been exposed to a lot when they come in, so they're just picking things up without any judgment. Um, we are very fortunate here. I mean, we really have some super, super, superstar wonder grads that come in as, I mean, I don't know, I can't even imagine this. I was born in 1975, but they come in as a freshman and they've already, you know, uh, been exposed to open frameworks and processing and they did an Arduino project in 11th grade and now they're ready to, uh, you know, put on their fourth website on the internet. Right. So, um, we're getting these students coming in, but at the same time, uh, you know, you can't kid yourself. Some of these students actually don't know how to hold a hammer. Right? Literally. Right. So the right. first day when you have an assignment for them where after they've become familiar with, uh, you know, Rhino and they've built this thing that they're going to cut on the router, they cut the thing and then you have these pieces of materials and there we have this amazing circus of, you know, people trying to handle materials in the real world and use, a, use you know, sandpaper and, you know, none of that stuff is really obvious. So you have to be, you have to be taught and you're, you, there's a lot of uh, scaffolding that goes into that. But what I do see that's positive is that when you introduce something to someone that's a complete workflow and because of this cultural awareness they have of uh, data being transportable, data from one place can just go into another place and become some other thing, then you can actually get through fairly complex um, processes with people in short amounts of time. So for instance, um, I'm, I have a deep interest in folding and origami and, and just as a means of fabrication, the economy that that produces and the portability. So uh, I do a project with the students where they find something and they make a model of it. And with a you know, fairly approachable off-the-shelf workflow that's available, they unfold these structures and then they cut them out and put them back together and then somehow make them presentable. So that really, you know, five, ten years ago, that kind of workflow was not accessible to a lot of people, whereas now... Um, I see that students within a week, within two weeks, they can turn around projects that bring in a, a lot of different uh, work processes together. The same with the whole world of printmaking that, you know, is very active at CNU. So we have a big print shop with silk screens and mesotones and, you know, big presses and everything. And, um, you know, a student comes and they've made an image that actually started as an analog photograph, but then they scanned it and vectorized it and moved it around, and now they're going to cut it on the router on a wood block, but then they're going to take it back and print on, you know, paper with it. So that whole process is really um, very exciting for me. When someone is finding the right tools for the right stages of a process so that you don't get too far from your concept uh, because of the tools. So it, it seems like an uh, ironic solution to a problem that tools can cause, but when these workflows are arranged for people and all of it is in the same space, I think really magical, magical things can happen. Yeah, well, in a situation like that where someone, you know, goes through this process, and I think most people in the digital world have followed you in that workflow right up to the point where the CNC router created a wood block. And then all of a sudden, it's like, oh, and somehow ink gets applied to that and it gets put on paper, which has to be handled in some sort of way. And I think people just all of a sudden sort of conceptually for people coming from a digitally focused world, well, magic happened, right? <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. How do, you, how do you manage that? Do you like... Do you work with other uh, instructors at CMU and sort of like pass the students off? Or do you personally embrace the technology so that you can work with them throughout the entire workflow? Yeah, very good question. Um, uh, I'll tell you exactly what I do. I, um, I learn all of the technologies firsthand myself. It's, I find it very difficult for these kinds of things, especially when you're in the shop with students and responsible for their safety and, and interested in their success. It's really hard to delegate um, the basic knowledge of how things work. So my workflow at CMU has been to, uh, to you know, find a set of things that we need to do a large number of things. So again, an economy of tools applied in very different ways to very different workflows. 
And then I design a course around it. So a good um, example is a course that I started to teach last year as uh, a first semester freshman course. The course is called Hey Robot, Let's Make Something. Hmm. And this course is a mini, so it's only seven weeks. And this is really testament to the level of um, energy that the students bring to it. In the seven weeks, the students learn how to use Rhino 3D quite well. And they get introduced to a laser cutter and then a CNC router and then a 3D printer if they want or some kind of mold making scheme. Okay. So, um, you know, the way it goes is I show up the first day and I have a series of things to teach them. And then they have 10 hours of homework to do in one week, which is legit at CMU. Hmm. And then, the, you know, the second week they show up and they have to pass a test. And the test is that I bring six small objects, five calipers and a ruler. And they all trade, and 15 minutes per object, you make a model of it. And you'd just be amazed at how um, rapidly that can go if you just try to employ some of the teaching techniques that I think our friends in computer science and engineering, especially at CMU, have been very aware of for a long time. Um, you can actually get people to, you know, in a very accelerated way, become uh, comfortable with complex workflows. But now, to really address your question, I'll, t I'll, I'll just tell you the evolution of this course. Um, my, uh, Goal, my dream really at CMU is to find these opportunities like teaching a course for freshmen called Hey Robot, Let's Make Something that shows them the ropes for how to use the basic machine fabrication schemes that are everywhere. So the 3D printer, the laser cutter, and the CNC router. Okay. And then um, I try to find people that can teach these courses instead of me, ideally even better than me. And I pass off the courses to them and I pick a new battle. So what we've done now is this course is going to become a staple in the School of Art. It'll be offered every semester for freshmen. And it'll be taught by, um, you know, for the first time, I'm very lucky to have one of our very, very talented superstar MFA alumni, Steve Gersh, who's going to teach it for me. And we talked a lot about how the course should change. And we made a very critical decision. Uh, hey, robot, let's make something is now going to become a course where you use a robot to make something that is going to help you make something else with your hands. So this is like the school of art way of thinking about these kinds of things. So that right away means the thing that the machine spews out is not done. That right. is not the end. Right. So it'll be a, there'll be a whole section on jigs and dyes. There'll yeah. be a whole section on making mold negatives. There'll be a whole section on stencil. So all these ways of working with machine fabrication that just gives you a very, very accurate, effective, precise tool for doing something that finally is with your hands. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty confident that that course is going to be a lot richer that way, and I'm really glad to have Steve's help, and yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing what the students do with that. That's a real interesting evolution um, to, to consider going from uh, having the goal be to create something, changing it to where the goal is to create tools to make even more complex futures. That's, that's pretty amazing. It's a great, uh, great twist. Um, but I would also say that that probably is kind of another hallmark of your work over the years. I would say that you have been, you, you yourself have been a tool maker of some sort for as long as I've known of you. You know, going back to um, different libraries that you made and shared for the Max community, uh, your work on the Maxwino project to introduce uh, introduce the Arduino into the visual programming world. Um, some of the early things you were doing with connectivity uh, between devices. Uh, I know right now you're very active in working in some other microprocessor systems. You actually were uh, are part of a uh, this you do. Uh, uh, world that I'm yeah, I'm yeah. currently obsessed with, um, and what what is it about tool making that you personally find satisfying? Because it seems like you must. Uh, it's it's been oh, something that has kind of been a thread throughout your entire career. Yeah, I absolutely do. Um, maybe it's just my sign. You know, I'm a Sagittarius and um, a knowledge seeker and system builder and looking up 45 degrees the whole time. So kind of looking <laughs> over the hill. Uh, uh, what might come of what I do as opposed to, you know, what will I do? And in the music community, again, I owe it to Max and Wessel and Adrian and all those people that made so many wonderful things. Matt Wright is someone I should mention also. I should have mentioned him earlier. He's so critical to me just learning how to deal with um, 
with complicated problems and in, in complicated environments. But um, you're right, in the last year or so, I've become very interested in this whole um, embedded platform world, starting with the Raspberry Pi and now the Udo that we're involved with, with CMU and the University of Siena. Right. Um, what I'm really interested in there is to, to see if we can do a redo, to kind of start over and see what, after all that's been done since Arduino uh, point 0.9, 10 years ago, um, mm -hmm. What can we do now with physical computing education that um, will really allow us to not start with a deficiency in some place or another? And I'll, I'll give you as an example something that is anecdotally really dear to me. About, it, it must have been 10 years ago now, one day I was sitting at Sinmat in, at my, my desk and, you know, slaving away on some, some Max problem. And David Wessel comes into the room freaking out about this thing called support vector machines. So he comes in and he says, Ali, I've been reading all night. These support vector machines, they're going to change the world. This is 2003, right? Okay. And I say, okay, David, that's cool. So, you know, what, what do they do? And he says, oh, well, they let you map anything to anything. And they, you know, take something that's very complex and represent it internally in an even higher dimensionality. And then you can, you know, see all these things that you wouldn't see otherwise. Like, wow, that's amazing, David. So now, uh, fast forward 10 years. What I see after six years of... Um, teaching is that 90% of interactive art that's made by students relies on the scale object <laughs> or the map function in the Arduino world. So that very basic linear mapping of one thing to another is where we are now in this community about relating input to output, which in some ways, like, that's okay, I'm glad that we have that, but wow, are we missing out? Wow, are we missing out on, on the kind of advances that have been made in machine learning specifically you know, as long back as 10 years ago. So I've become really keen on the whole you do and Raspberry Pi thing because now we're starting to have these higher level environments where we can really have very sophisticated machine learning and machine listening and machine vision applied to all the stuff that we love, which is making sound or making movement or making video. So all that world of um, real time audio video. So specifically, one thing that's taken um, a lot of my time right now is uh, I'm working on porting a series of machine learning algorithms together with Jamie Bullock, who's a developer I'm very fortunate to work with in the UK, uh, to port some of these really standard things that uh, very few people got very excited about 10 years ago, but are now becoming increasingly relevant for us. So um, these things, hopefully, in the, in the, few, in the upcoming uh, weeks or two, there will be a release that will allow people with Macs or Pure Data on Intel or ARM um, use some of these very sophisticated and standardized machine learning techniques. And uh, yeah, I, I think very good things in very simple classroom settings can come out of that. I'm really looking forward to that. I think that's exciting because you're right. And in a way, it's almost too bad that the name of these objects or functions are these super inclusive names like map and scale because it sort of implies this is how you map, this is how you scale. And it doesn't really open the door to some of the rich mapping options. Okay. Um, can you really quickly tell us what are some of the machine learning things that are going to be part of this library? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, we really started with the most basic things that need to be available to people that are interested in mapping gesture to sound or sensors to movement or whatever. So specifically, uh, it, it'll, it's a package of stuff that you can actually find on GitHub. Um, that's called MLLib for Machine Learning Library. And it's a, a port of a really beautiful library we found called the Gesture Recognition Toolkit, It's you know which itself is an a, amalgamation of many other places, but the algorithms specifically are support vector machines. Support vector machines are used for when you have lots of inputs and you just need to classify certain arrangements of those inputs. Okay. Uh, Multi-layer perceptrons, which are a subclass of artificial neural networks that help you do art, you know, uh, arbitrary N to M mapping. Mm -hmm. So when you have seven inputs and four outputs and you don't really care how it gets done, but you want to have some known destinations. Right linear regression and logical regression again for classification of uh, mm -hmm. you know large feature vectors hidden markov models for decision making and and categorization classification and dynamic time warping which is again a kind of um, um, gesture recognition tool where you can differentiate between complex streams of data without really having to get into the numbers without having to do a lot of arithmetic or math that you know our students are never going to be able to do 
But what I see more and more is that, you know, actually a CS student who knows how to use SVMs also doesn't know what an SVM does inside. The point is to know that this black box has been standardized for 10 years. So I'm just hoping to bring some of these things into our world in, in ways that I, I find have been lacking and prohibitive. I'm going to have to go and dive into that because that actually sounds like something that solves some problems I've got right in my face right now. Um, mm-hmm. For the good, listeners, good. we will uh, put a link up to that uh, on the webpage. Only I know that you have got to run off and do some more teaching and interaction with students. I want to thank you so much for the time that you spent with us today. I hope that uh, listeners will take the time to go and take a look at not only the work you're doing, but the work that ArtFab's doing at CMU and uh, the work that uh, even the people at Berkeley continue to do. Uh, David Wessel remains to me a fascinating guy. He seems like he must never sleep. The Yoda. Is, <laughs> the, the Yoda. <laughs> Indeed. But thank you so much. and I appreciate your time and uh, have a great day. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. And so there we go. Um, Ali is just involved in so many things. I was really glad that he was willing to share. I hope that you were maybe taking notes on some of the names and uh, web locations of the information that he talked about. I'll put some of that on the website. Um, but learning more about what the people in at Berkeley were doing and learning more about what Carnegie Mellon's doing now is probably in your best interest. There's some amazing work being done, and I am super happy to be able to bring a little bit of light to it. Uh, thanks, everyone, for your support of the podcast, and keep on listening. Again, if you have any comments or ideas for people who we might want to interview, please drop me a line, ddg at cycling74. And also, if you uh, live in the Portland area, I hope that you're prepping yourself to visit the Six Festival that's coming up at the beginning of April. I'm going to be up there with Gregory Taylor, uh, Tom Hamer, and Mark Hendrickson to do a little performance. I'll also be doing a, uh, a workshop uh, demo at the uh, Cool Control Voltage shop up there. So that should be great. Uh, I like to pro myself a little bit when I can. Otherwise, uh, have a great week, and I'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.